Let's pray. Our dear Father in heaven, we join our brother Stephen to give you thanks and praise God for your goodness in our lives. We are here this morning as your people because we know you have summoned each of us here. We give you thanks for all that you have given us and all that you have done to tell us that you care about us throughout the week. And now at the beginning of the week, we come again, for we know that we need you, Father. We need you to continue to speak to us. We need you to continue to grant us grace that we may know that you are present with us. We need you to help us walk your ways. We need you to help us honor you, worship you every moment of our, da of our days, not just now. So now as we turn to your word, our Father in heaven, we are reminded that you said, men do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. Would you please grant us ears that hear, eyes that see, hearts that r are ready to embrace your word. And dear Father, may you look upon me with your mercies. I am not worthy, save for your grace. Keep me behind the cross of your Son, Jesus Christ, and have your way in me so that together with my brothers and sisters, we may hear your word, be refreshed, be encouraged, be affirmed, be corrected, be strengthened in our faith, be strengthened in our love for you. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, dear Father. We ask this, through Jesus Christ, your Son, who is our Savior and Lord, who reigns with you, together with the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, if you have the Bible, would you please turn your Bible, whether it is digital or hard copy. I think it would be good that we look at the Bible so that we together, yeah, we together, um, if I may use the word, get the most of uh, what the Lord has kept and preserved for us in his word. We have read together uh, Psalm 51 uh, from the New International Version, but if you will look at whatever version you have before you, whether it is ESV, English Standard Version, or New Living Translation, or, or King James Version, or New King James Version, or, or New International Version. Just keep at it. We have read it through, but now I'm going to read to you the one from the Hebrew Bible, yeah, in English. The Prayer of David. Be gracious to me, O God, in accordance with your covenant love. In your great tenderness, blot out my acts of rebellion. Wash me quite clean of my waywardness. Cleanse me from my failings. I do recognize my acts of rebellion. My failings confront me constantly. I failed you, you alone. I have done what you regard as wrong. So you should be, so you should be acknowledged as right in your sentence and justified in giving judgment. Yes, I have been wayward from birth. I have failed you since the day of my conception. Yes, it is inner trustworthiness that pleases you. You teach me inward wisdom. Remove my sin with hyssop, 
so that I can be clean. Wash me so that I am whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the one you have broken rejoice. Turn your face away from my failures. Blot out all my wayward acts. Create in me a clean mind, O God. Renew in me a steadfast spirit. Do not dismiss me from your presence. Do not take from me your Holy Spirit. Restore to me the joy of being saved by you. Sustain me with your willing spirit. I will teach your ways to rebels, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from death, God my Savior. I will declare the praise of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips. My mouth will proclaim your praise. You would have no pleasure in sacrifice were I to bring one. You would not want a whole offering. A godly sacrifice is a broken spirit, a heart that is broken and crushed. You would not disdain, O God. In your graciousness, deal kindly with Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then find pleasure in right sacrifices, in whole offerings given over totally to you. Then let bulls ascend upon your altar. This is not um, my original hard work. This is something I picked up in the course of the reading in, prepara in preparing for the sermon. And I thought that this is a, this is a beautiful uh, paraphrase or beautiful uh, uh, alternate, alternate translation for us to read side by side with, uh, with the versions that we are more uh, familiar with, such as the New International Version. But when you read it, I hope that you can sense the, the desperateness yeah, of, of, of David praying the prayer. Yeah? I hope that when you read this prayer, you sense a broken man in this man, you know, in, in David. That he sees that you know, he is found out, not just is he found out, that he is desperately uh, sinful. You know, there is no justification whatsoever yeah, uh, in his life. And there is only one person who could help him. There is only one person who could make him clean. Because what he has done, no matter what he does, no matter what, how hard he tries, he cannot get rid of the sin that he has committed. Yeah? And the story of David's sin is quite familiar to all of us. And I thought that you know, it's a prayer that we want to take to heart again so that we can understand what it is like to recognize our sin and what it is like to recognize that only God can help us. That no matter what good work that we do, it is never good enough to get rid of our sin. And that desperation, in desperation, David called out to God uh, for, for forgiveness is something that we want to learn, is something that we want to appreciate, understand, and see that to be part of our uh, spirituality. You know, for a very long time, you know, after reading through the Bible, this is going to be my fifth year run reading through the Bible from, from Genesis to, uh, to Revelation. You know, and there's this one question that I take with me when I read the Old Testament, especially the his historical narratives of the Israelites, you know. And I say, God, I am sorry, but when I read about David, I cannot understand why is he a man after your own heart? He's such a horrible man. He's a horrible man, God. How could, he do, how, could he, how could he be termed as man after your own heart? Not until I read this, not until I take a closer look at Psalm 51 again, and I understand a little bit more, why is this man called man after God's own heart? Here is a man who recognized how horrible he is. Here is a man who recognized his sin. 
Here is a man who recognized what it takes for him to be washed clean. Here is a man who says, there is no excuses I can make. God has found me out. Here is a man who realized that he desperately need God to make him right. Do any of us sense that in our lives? Brothers and sisters, at our gathering this morning, we are coming to the Lord's table. The Protestant celebrates two sacraments. What are they, brothers and sisters? Other than Brother David, uh, other than Brother Stephen. What are the two sacraments that the Lord Jesus himself asks us to celebrate or to observe? What are the two sacraments? I should say other than Thomas. Huh? <laughs> Those of us who have gone to the seminary and all. Yeah, only two sacraments. Baptism. And where do you find that uh, the command on sa uh, sacrament of baptism to be celebrated? David can, uh, Thomas cannot say, Stephen cannot say. Where can you read that? Sacrament of baptism, where do you read that? Come on. Say that again. Which where? Good guess. Some more? I think I, sh I need to do that more. La. The thing is that uh, uh, Pastor Lucy needs to do this because I'm retired already. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Kalfa, where do we read that? Instructions to celebrate baptism. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, and, and, and baptize them in, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, what about the Holy Communion? That's the, the other sacrament, the other ordinance, or the other, the other celebration, right? Uh, that I, I would say that ordained by Jesus, yeah? which is the Holy Communion. Where do you read that? Wow, well, time to read your Gospels, huh? Yeah. Actually, it is recorded in several, or especially in the Synoptic Gospels. Yeah? Synoptic Gospels means the Gospels that you look at together. Sin, together. Optic means look. Yeah, see, yeah? Sin, optic. Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Look, yeah, these are the Gospels that we look, that we look at like, together, Synoptic Gospels. In the Synoptic Gospels, especially before Christ's uh, uh, before Christ passion, yeah, before his arrest and before his crucifixion, Jesus celebrated the Holy Communion and he said, do this, right, in remembrance of me. Okay, do this as often as he would in remembrance of me, reinforced by St. Paul, yeah, in 1 Corinthians chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter, Chapter? Cannot remember. Okay, this one I'm not going to give answer. Okay, you all have to find out, right? So these are the true sacraments that we observe. Why? Why is that so? Because it's very important. I'm not here to talk about the sacrament of baptism today, but I'm going to get us to talk about, think together about the sacrament of the Holy Communion. Okay? Let me share this with you, that in the course of... Uh, the, uh, the pastoral ministry when I was still actively in, uh, in pastoral ministry one of the important ministries that I recognize that we pastors must never neglect doing and that is visiting church members whether they are sick or they are not sick must visit church members yeah make appointment to visit church members even if it means to come and have dinner with you or to have lunch with you all right so i'm telling you if pastor lucy said i'm coming to visit you please don't say pastor i'm all right i'm okay no problem with me please go to other people who need you because that's what i get i said no i'm your pastor i like to come and have lunch with you i like to come and have dinner with you and then we get to talk about our faith story yeah because that's the role of the pastor yeah, that's the role of the pastor. The pastor is a shepherd. The pastor must know where are we in our walk with the Lord. Yeah. So if you come and visit your lay leader, please don't say I'm lay leader. I'm all right, hundred percent. Please don't say that. 
yeah? Because we all grow together, yeah? No matter how clever you are, you may be a university professor. If the pastor say, I want to come and visit you, welcome the pastor. Because he or she needs to do her role, right? And so when I visited church members, especially those who are not able to come to church, what I usually do is that I will celebrate the Holy Communion with them. Because the Holy Communion is a sacrament that the Lord Jesus Christ himself instructed that we do in remembrance of him. Because without Christ Jesus' death, we are not reconciled with God. Means we are separated from God. Means we have no understanding of what God is doing in our life. Means our life is not forgiven. We have no Holy Spirit within us. We are not able to follow God, right? It's just that's that important. So when I celebrated the Holy Communion with some church members, so I'll try to get them to tell me the story. So instead of using the liturgy in the United Methodist hymnal, the liturgy would be our conversation. So I say, Auntie so and so, What's the story of the Holy Communion? Thanks be to God, many of them are able to say, oh, we do this in remembrance of Jesus. I said, what do we remember of Jesus? Yeah, not all of them are able to say that. I'm just sharing this with us so that we begin to slowly take to heart the, the sacredness, the solemnity, and the preciousness of the Lord's Supper every time we celebrate it, so that it does, it does not get reduced to a mere ritualism. I say this because it's a real thing. Some church members said, are you a pastor? I cannot, I cannot explain to you. I see church members go out, ma. they all go out, and I also go, join them and go out and receive the, take the bread and, uh, you know, etc. I, I feel very sad in my heart that the Lord's Supper has become is reduced a mere ritual. It has no impact in our lives. The Lord's Supper has no role to play in our spiritual formation. That's very sad. Because every time we celebrate the Holy Communion, it must be seen as our means of grace to draw closer to God, to repent more and more of our sin, and to appreciate God's love more and more for our lives, and to love God more and more that it radiates into our love for people around us, including the world that we live in. It must have that impact. That's, that's why we celebrate the Holy Communion, because it reminds us of what God has done. He sent us His only Son, Jesus Christ, not to come and play with us, not to have fun with us, but to give His life as a ransom for our sins. So brothers and sisters, as we gather together, this is the first Sunday, and LSMC celebrates Holy Communion on first Sunday. We are coming to the Lord's table to participate in the Holy Communion with the one we worship and serve. So we pause to ask ourselves in a deep prayerful fashion, what is the Lord's table about that we are coming, that we are coming for? Yes, we will be partaking of the bread, that is, the body of Jesus Christ, broken and given as a sacrifice to ransom, to ransom our sins. To be reconciled with God, whom we have rebelled against. And yes, we are also drinking of the cup, that is, the drinking of the blood of Christ that was shed for the cleansing of our sins that are an affront to God and this sin which eventually destroys us. At the Lord's table, we are confronted by God's great and gracious love in that His great and gracious love be appreciated well. And when that gracious love is appreciated well, it enables us to confront face to face with no excuse our sins. If we are to face our sins with, without God's love, it's going to be very hard, isn't it? But at the Lord's table, 
God's great and gracious love helps us confront our sin with no excuse. At the Lord's table, His great and gracious love compels us to repent, turn away from our waywardness, and turn to Him. It's more than just turning to Him. It's more than just giving up a certain act or, 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 or a certain sinful act or sinful habit. It's more than that. It's a change of way of life. It's a change of a way of life. Growing up, you know, we... Growing up, I remember we... My, my, my good mother will always want us to take afternoon naps, you know. So we come back, we take our, come back from school, we take our shower, we have our lunch, and then we're supposed to take our nap. Because after nap, you're supposed to get up and do your homework, do your revision, etc., etc. For the life of me, I don't know why is it that when we are growing up, uh, we never like naps. Uh. Now as we grow older, uh, naps are so much appreciated, isn't it? So those were days when I would rebel against my mother. I would sneak out, you know, sneak out to go and uh, sneak out to, to join my other friends, you know, to play the thieves and the what, uh, what, the, the what, the, the, the what's that, what, the thief and the what, uh, thief and, and uh, you know, you, I cannot remember the game really, but it's just everything outside is just so, so much more fantastic than taking the, the nap that my mother thought is very good for us, you know. And my mother being a great disciplinarian, whenever he, whenever I came back and kena tangkap, uh, you know, uh, rod was never spared. Yeah, whether we are girls or boys, rod was not spared us, you know. Then I'll say, ask, uh, Ma, I will not do again, I will not do again, please don't, please don't wet me, you know. I will not do again, I will not do again, you know. But do you think I'll do again? Sure, man, do again, you know, do again, you know. So at that moment, when kena tangkap that time, uh, wow, very repenting, you know, and very remorseful, you know. Ma, I won't do again, I won't do again, you know. Uh, so at that moment, it was a repentance of sorts, isn't it? But I have not understood my mother's great love for me. I have now taken the trouble to appreciate what she was trying to do in my life. So there was repentance. So it's a repentance for that moment, repentance of, so that I escape the punishment. But I've never really appreciated what my mother was trying to do. Sometimes, now when I look back, sometimes when we come to the Lord's table, sorry God, you know, I did this that I know that it's not right. But uh, after Holy Communion, we go back, we say, la vie, life's the same. So what do we understand by why is it that we need to repent? Repent is not just a giving up of a certain act, sinful act or sinful habit, but it's really about a change of lifestyle, a change of our way of life, turning away from our rebellious ways and turning to God in repentance and loving obedience. That's repentance. As a pastor, I know how beautiful it is when we sing the song, The steadfast love of the Lord never cease. Favorite song, right? We all love it, you know. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. You know, very much we like that song. And we quote that. That is taken from Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 to 23. We quote it in context and out of context a lot of times. Why? To ease our guilt. To, to give us a quick comfort uh, from, our, from our guilty conscience. Yeah? And the other favorite psalm is Psalm 103 and verses 8 to 4 about, you know, God is not angry with us forever, you know. He removes our sin from as far as from what? From east to the west, yeah, from, from what? Oh, oh, we love that, you know. We love that. And when we quote that verse, uh, it gives us a kind of a, you know, tranquilizer of salt uh, to our guilt conscience. But we know deep inside us, a lot of things not put right before God. Deep inside us, we know that we have not really understood 
God's gracious love for us. And then one of the things that I used to do as a pastor, which I know that I need to repent, is that whenever something, somebody has, you know, somebody come and said, you know, oh, I've done this, you know, very wrong, you know. So before helping the person to see the need to turn away and to welcome the Spirit of God into one's life, you know, to help. You know what verses we like to quote? It's okay. As long as you confess, God will forgive your sins. Which verse is it? Which verse? Which verse is it? 1 John 1 9. How does it go? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all our unrighteousness. So just confess and that's it. But really or not, that's repentance is another thing. Let me ask you a question. Does God forgive? Brothers and sisters, does God forgive? Will God forgive? If that's the case, then why am I making us take an unnecessary guilt trip by getting us to consider our sins and question our repentance of them? Is there a need for that? Let me humbly submit that unless we appreciate our sins and sinfulness, our repentance is unclear. Our repentance lacks earnestness. If that be the case, it is very likely we have only a slight idea of the greatness of God's mercy and love. Therefore, we might not have known the weight of his forgiveness. If that's the case, then we have not really embraced his forgiveness of our sins for what it is. Please let me say that again. Unless we appreciate our sins and our sinfulness, our repentance is unclear. It lacks earnestness. That be the case, it is very likely we have only a slight idea of the greatness of God's mercy and love. Probably we just like to think of God's love for what we think we need, but not for all that it is. Hence, we might not have known the weight of God's forgiveness and therefore not embrace His forgiveness of our sins for what it is, but only for that little that we like it to be. Therefore, it's important for us to appreciate what we need to repent of and what our repentance is like. Those of us who appreciate English literature, this English poet, John Donne, he wrote this, Teach me how to repent, for that is as good as thou hast sealed my pardon with thy blood. Let me say that again. Teach me how to repent, for that is as good as thou hast sealed my pardon with thy blood. In other words, this is very profound. Do you really, do, you, do we really, really understand that our pardon is sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ? Do we really understand that? Do we take that to heart? For if we can't, then we need to pray, teach me how to repent. For that is as good as thou hast sealed my pardon with thy blood. I thought that's profound. And I thought that just these two sentences of this poem calls for my utmost deep prayer and reflection. 
getting very heavy, huh, brothers and sisters. It's my prayer that we understand what we are repenting of. It cannot be just here. It cannot. Or we continue to be sleepy Christians. Or we continue to be careless Christians. We have no appreciation how sinful we are. We have no idea how desperately we need God. We have no idea how desperately the world needs God. Most of us, if not all of us, know that Psalm 51 is a psalm of David. David actually did not see his sin as he ought to, not until Prophet Nathan confronted him. Do you realize that? Many of us just like the story of David, you know, walking on the balcony and saw Bathsheba taking shower and then he, he wanted Bathsheba. That very good. That's all that happened. And then we all know what he did. And then after that, uh, after killing his, her husband, uh, after covering up, uh, after conspired with uh, his, his chief of staff, Joab, after covering up, he carried on his merry ways, you know. He got people to cover up his grounds and he carried on as, his, as, a, as a great king. He could not see his sin. Not until Prophet Nathan confronted him. I want you to think about that, brothers and sisters. Many of us can't see our sin until we have been, fu until we have been found out. Could I ask you to turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 12? 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 <coughs> Samuel chapter 12. Perhaps I'd like to read from 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 26 onwards. Huh? When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. And after, after the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Nothing is recorded for us that David realized that he has <coughs> committed adultery. He has committed murder. He has deceived the whole nation as a king. Chapter 12. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare it, to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Verse 7, Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. That is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you a master's house. 
I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. But why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? David could not see his sin. It's very interesting, no? How come he cannot see his sin? How come David could not see that what he was doing is wrong? That's something for us to think about. Could it be that he has become so powerful? That he could do as he like. He has power. He has money. He can order his soldier to go here and go there. He became invincible, doesn't didn't he? He could do as he like. And even after doing that, he could not see that what he was doing was wrong. I actually ask myself this question. How does he treat his warriors? How was he treating his warriors? Are they just pawns to be placed at this corner of the battle or that corner of the battle? How did he view these women, another person's wife? something that he must own? What does he think of fellow human beings around him? He could not see that he was in a very dark place. They would, could not see that until Nathan brought a very interesting mirror for him to look at. Chapter, two, chapter 12, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, we read, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. We read Psalm 51 just now. Realizing his sins for what they are, David sought repentance for forgiveness. I'm quite sure none of us here experienced David's gross sins. I don't think any of us here have committed adultery. I don't think any of us here have committed murder. I don't think any of us have abused power the way King David did. I don't think any of us have done the cover-up as David did. Gross sins. But David's confession of his sin and pleas for God's forgiveness speak for us nevertheless. One writer said, Psalms speak for us. A lot of times when we read the Bible, the Bible speaks to us, but Psalms speak for us. The Psalm that David wrote in Psalm 51, help us. Only God knows what sin I have committed what sin you have committed, brothers and sisters. It takes great humility to recognize what our sins are. But Psalm 51 helps us, helps to speak for us. Psalm 51 helps us confront our sins and sinfulness so that we may more fully appreciate God's great mercies and His forgiveness. We all like Easter Sunday, you know, not so much Good Friday. We must remember Good Friday, brothers and sisters. For without Good Friday, there is no Easter Sunday. So before we quickly mouth and profess and sing about God's steadfast love, the steadfast love of God is just hollow profession for us if we have not understood the gravity of our sin. And the likeness we make of our repentance. 
That's how it is. So in this Psalm 51, there are five things or five aspects that I'd like to get your attention to join me to look at about repentance of sins. First, repentance, true repentance, requires us to face our sin for what they are. Meaning to say, if I've committed adultery, I cannot say, Ayah, I got these grave needs there. Ayah, who asked Bathsheba to go and take her shower there? Yeah? Why has she to look so sexy? You know? Why has she to dress like that? No. No excuse. I face my sin as it is. I covered it. She is somebody's wife. I wanted her. Repentance, true repentance, requires us to face our sin for what they are. Psalm 51 verse 3 says, For I recognize, for I know my sin, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Remember, brothers and sisters, let's not become too familiar with the Bible. Huh? That's, not, that's the danger, you know, that we become, we think that we know the Bible so well, you know. We don't need to know it anymore. We, we can just go by, you know, without checking it. David says, I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. I know my sin. Do we know our sin? Do I know my sin? A good Old Testament teacher of the Old Testament, a good teacher of the Old Testament, John Golden Gay, somebody that you might want to check out on, yeah? I really appreciate that scholarly uh, and, and the diligence that he has put in to help us appreciate the Old Testament much better and together with it, very pastoral instructions, yeah? Uh, uh, coming from, from his research and, and, and studies. He actually helped us see that there are three words that, is be, that were used by the psalmist to, uh, to refer to sin. Yeah? For us, we say sin, sin. Right? If I were to ask you, what is sin? Nilima, how do you define sin? Mr. Kaur, can you define sin for me? What is sin? Doing things that is not pleasing to God. Patricia, what is sin? Transgressions of God's law. Yong Ching, what is sin? Wrongdoing. Yeah. So a lot of things, a lot of times we hear these examples as quoted is about doing something that is wrong to God, right? Wrong in the eyes of God. But when we look at Psalm 51, the psalmist appreciate that his sin is more than that act of adultery. His sin was more than the act of conspiracy. His sin was more than that covetousness. His sin was more than committing murder of Uriah. His sin was more than deception. He said more to that. So there were three words. There are three words employed to refer to sin. Look at your Bible. Yeah? One, transgressions. Two, iniquity, right? Did you see that? Three, sin. Look at that. Check your Bible. It's, very, it's in your Bible too. It's not just in my Bible. Yeah? Transgressions, iniquity, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and my sin. And this is repeated uh, throughout Throughout the, throughout the psalm, okay? Firstly, transgression. Why, how, how do we see transgression different from iniquity and from sin? That's when it helps us see. If we can understand this, then we, can, we are more able to question our repentance. Yeah. Transgressions characterizes rebellion. We read the word transgression in verse 1b. 
3a, 13a of Psalm 51. Rebellion basically means defying God. Live a life in defiance of Him. I don't believe you. I don't believe that you exist. Don't tell me anything. Let me live my own life yeah, in defiance of God and do our lives, live our lives in such a way that denies the existence of God. Yeah? And God spoke of, you know, God spoke of Israelites defying Him. Yeah? In the, especially in the prophetic literature, huh? God says that I always treat Israel as my son. But my son defies me. Leh. My son defies me. How does my son defies me? I say you are not to worship any other god, but my, fun, my son defies me. My son worship many other gods. My son, God, everybody bring the gold together and form a golden calf and then worship God, the golden calf. My son aped the practice of many other nations, worship the god of Molech. The God of Baal, the Ashura Post. I told my son, you shall not marry any other nation. But they are intermarrying, they are worshipping, they are adopting their gods. Transgressions in defiance of God. So firstly, I want to repent of my transgressions. How am I defying God? Usually, it's really quite subtle. First thing, I get up in the morning. First thing you get up in the morning, what do you do, brothers and sisters? Are you checking your phone? Many of my friends, first thing, they check their phones, you know. Others of us, first thing, we check the phone to check our stock market. How is it doing? Is God having my heart? Am I giving Him my heart still? Is He having my best time? Is God having my utmost? The second word used in Psalm 51 about sin is iniquity. Wash away all my iniquity. Verse 2a, 5a, 9b. What does iniquity refer to? I'd like you to pay attention. Iniquity refers to the innate propensity within us to turn away from God and his ways. I think those of us who are parents, you know, this is very good for you. You know, you go to bed early, rise up early, do this, but your child, not that your child does not love you, but your child just, just wants his own ways, you know, very willful. Yeah. This, this innate propensity, you know, it's almost like that natural draw huh, to 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 go away from God, yeah? To go away from God and not to follow the ways of God, yeah. Maybe some of the theologians call it the the depravity, the sinful nature within us. You know? That's this this sinful magnet uh, that draws them away from the ways of God inside us, you know, that sinful magnet inside us drawing us away from God and always getting into waywardness, uh, a wayward away from God. Yeah? So this iniquity characterizes waywardness inside us. So the, so the psalmist talk about, you know, surely that, you know, I, when I was conceived, huh, I already am having that waywardness within. Yeah? The third word is the generic word, which we often know, we often read, and that is sin. But in Psalms 51, sin refers to failings. Failings. A failure to heed God's word, a failure to honor God, a failure in our duty, a failure to our people. Do you see that in David? It's very interesting that Second Samuel recorded for us that in those days 
when kings are supposed to be when kings are away in wars, David was in his palace. It's very interesting when we read the scripture and you know, we pay attention. David was supposed in the battlefield with his with his army, right? But he was at home. He was not where he was supposed to be. Yeah. Failure to meet God's expectations. St. Paul said it this way, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Means to say, we miss the mark. Yeah? In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it talks about uh, a picture that we want to place in mind is we want to shoot an arrow into the bullseye, right? but we missed it. We miss the expectations of us, failings. We fail. I fail to love God. I fail to honor Him. I fail to bring Him delight. I fail to care for my neighbor. I fail to love my neighbor. Yeah? Failings. But this failing will bear devastating consequences on all. Okay? You know, it's getting a little heavy for all of us, huh? but I hope that we begin to think about our sin and our repentance of sin. Yeah? So David failed in his duty. He gave in to his waywardness when he entertained his lust and covetousness. He rebelled against God's commandments when he coveted, he stole somebody's wife, he committed adultery, he deceived, he murdered, and he covered up. Worse, he carried on, life as usual, not until Nathan confronted him. David gave in to his waywardness. David failed God. David failed his people. I think if I were to say rebellion or iniquity, we probably will have a bit more, uh, we find these words perhaps a little, uh, a little alien from us, uh, maybe it's, uh, words that we are not, we are not able to immediately yeah, uh, understand. But if I were to say we fail one another, we can understand better. Yeah? It is said, we injure others, but we sin against God. Let me say that again. We injure others, but we sin against God. So we may think that it's a light thing. Sorry, law, I didn't keep my promise, law. Sorry, Lord, I slander you, Lord. Sorry, I cheated you, ah. Uh. Sorry, Lord, I talked bad behind you, ah. Uh. Sorry, ah. Uh. I cheated you of your money. Sound quite light. But we actually sin against God in all this. David understood that. He definitely has injured his people. He definitely has failed his people. He definitely has injured Uriah. He definitely has affected Joab as well. Yeah, his general would have known, wow, my king is like that one, you know. We can imagine the impact that he wa what he was doing upon the whole nation. They are all injured. The nation was injured by King David. But David said in verse 4, verse 4 he said, Against you and you alone have I sinned. So sometimes we may think that, you know, when we injure our brothers and sisters, and we say, sorry, Lord, you know. But if we are to understand how David see it, Man after God's own heart sees it. Against you and you alone have I sinned. As I said just now, we are more able to associate our failings more than when we talk about rebellion or, or, or iniquity. And we are quite afraid, you know, to be known as failures. But the thing is that we fail. We all fail. I fail. As a pastor, I failed many times, I know. I could not keep my promise. I overpromise. Yeah, I'd like to do very good Bible study with LSMC. I overpromise. Then I dump it on Brother Stephen. 
and got Brother Stephen to do what I promised the people. That's failures on my part. There's no discounting of that. And I pray that God will give me opportunity to repent, brother. I would like to be ready for my sermon. I like to preach well. I like God to use me as a servant. But I get myself involved in so very many things. There's just so little time left to let God speak to me before I speak to the people. I failed. We all failed. But as David said, against you and you alone have I sinned. I failed the people, but I've sinned against God. Our failings speak very clearly to our hearts. If we would be willing to listen to what David said, our failings speak of us sinning against God. Failure to look out for one another. Failure to respect one another. Why is it important? Because you are made in the image of God. I'm made in the image of God. All of us are made in the image of God. Regardless of your position in the society, regardless of the how many... God forgive me, I mustn't be crude. Huh? Whoever you are, all of us are made in the image of God. All of us are precious but the thing is brothers and sisters we see in our world that we use people but we love things is that not so brothers and sisters we love things we use people correct me if I'm wrong I'm sorry to say that the church is no different. We should be loving God, use and loving people. Use things to love people and love God, not the other way around. And I'm afraid we learn too quickly and we adopt very undiscerningly the ways of the greedy and consumeristic world. And it's not difficult to see that in the world that we live in today, where people are valued by the monetary game he or she is capable of a lot of times. So now we think of education for money less than education for good education to build healthy and wise peoples. Hospitals to make monies, less for health and healing. Am I right? That is the case. What about church? Is our church a place where, we, where people see that, oh, that's how we to be relate, relating to one another. Or that's how we uphold each other's dignity. Or oh, that's how we instruct one another. Or oh, that's how we encourage one another. Or oh, that's how we spur one another on in the ways of God. Or oh, that's how we show sincere care for one another. Is church like that? Brothers and sisters, we are now living in a time where it, we are told that the damage that's been done to planet Earth is irreversible. The damage we have done to Mother Earth has become irreversible. We no longer talk about global warming. We think about global boiling. It wasn't so hot like this year, right? It's become very bad. I will say, probably I will say, oh, none of my business, you know, I never cut down the trees in the forest. <laughs> I didn't cut down the forest, huh? You know, I, uh, 
you know, and I and I'm not responsible for all the greenhouses, and I'm not responsible for for all the uh, the fossils digging and and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, and the uh, petrol mine uh, and the uh, 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 fossil f mining. You know, I'm not responsible for all that. But brothers and sisters, repentance does not give any discount for our sins. A friend of mine heard that I've retired and tried to get me to be involved in this environmental called creation care and uh, gave me Bible study material and get me to read up and said, you know, uh, let's do something about it. I said, um, no, la, I think I need to see repentance in my own life first. I need to see that, you know, I do not litter. I need to see that, you know, I help the people around me in my apartment that I'm staying, you know, care for environment. I need to see that, you know, I don't use plastic. I need to, uh, uh, as unless I'm totally, absolutely neat. I need to see that I need to do recycling. I need to see that, you know, I buy only what I need. I need to see that in my own life before I see that I do that. I see that to be part of my re repentance. Brothers and sisters, repentance first and foremost requires us to see our sin for what it is. No excuse. No excuse. And remember, when we, say, when we talk about repentance, we, re we repent in the light of God's great love for us. Repent. Repentance requires us to see our sin for what it is. Does our church hold up hope, brothers and sisters? Can our church be championing environment care? Can our church champion a birthday nation? Can we do that in small ways? Sin needs to be seen as it is in our repentance. Secondly, chapter 51, verses 1 to 6, we read about David's appealing to God's mercy and love. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression, my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at my birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. David banged on God's mercy and love. He makes this plea that speaks of his total banking on God's mercies. His words makes us realize that he, he knows that he can't deliver himself. He can't save himself. Because at the very point of his conception, there is already waywardness within him. There is already sin within him. He can't save himself. Only God can help him. Repentance does not say that I have done a good thing. God jolly well forgive me. I have made a good offering, big offering to the church. God has to forgive him. No. We look at David. He banked on God's mercies and love. Only God can help him. Because only God is perfectly truthful. He sees his sin as it is, he sees his sin from the very onset, even at the point of his conception. God sees him, God knows him, God knows us. God sees us, God knows us. So we come to God pleading on his mercies and pleading on his love, not pleading on our righteousness, not pleading on our law abidingness, but pleading on God's mercies and love. Thirdly, repentance is one, true repentance is one that expresses a desire for a renewal from within. Like I said, it's not just giving away or saying, okay, I don't gamble anymore. But 
but I'm doing many other things that I know will encourage gambling habit. Repentance, true repentance, expresses a desire for a renewal from within. Yeah, verses 7 to 12, where David says, Cleanse me with his soap and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Brothers and sisters, beyond coming to church, I pray that our worship one is one that exhibits a repentance that wells up from within, a desire that God continues to renew me. If I've been a Christian that I know I'm doing what my mother, my grandmother has asked me to do, go to church on Sunday, you know, it could be more than that. It got to be that desire. I know what my sin is like. I ask God for forgiveness, and I and God. More than this, not committing this sin anymore. Do an overhaul in my life. If I may use a word. Do an overhaul in my life. Put the right spirit within me. I don't have a clean heart, but please give me a clean heart. Give me a pure heart. Let me know you. Let me honour you. Let me love you, if I may put it in these words. Yeah? True repentance is one, that is one that expresses a desire for a renewal from within. A renewal from within. Want an ongoing, willing spirit within me to honor God, to walk with Him, to desire His will. Yeah? And for an emplacement of a willing spirit. And this is really an expression of a desire to be born anew of the Holy Spirit. Yeah? Some of my Christian friends, you know, we are very proud about, you know, we do everything very neat, neat and nice in church. Everything also neat and nice, neat and nice, you know. But when we come across something that is, that is really beyond our comfort zone, you now we stay away. We steer clear, you know. And I said, you know, Christian faith is never a neat and nice Christian faith where we have everything done according to our boundary, you know, everything nice and all. I said, no. Christian faith sometimes requires us to kneel, sometimes get, get us to need, need us to soil our hands and dirty our hands so that God's grace and God's love may be known. That speaks of renewal within. I said, forget about this, keeping this respectable Christian faith that we are doing. But in our workplace, are we participating in the deception? In our workplace, are we participating in corruption? Because that matters. That matters. So repentance, true repentance, really desire, calls for a true renewal from within. Yeah. A readiness to let the Spirit of God work in us and use us. Yeah. Use us to praise Him wherever we are. Fourthly, True repentance is one that desires to testify for God. Yeah? Now, this, not, this is more than people coming to church on Sunday and give testimony. Because if when we read Psalm 51, verses 13 to 15, David says this, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. More than coming to church, say nice testimony and to the applause of everybody, but really what is happening in our lives is something else. David talks about a true repentance that desires to testify for God, which is, which is seen in a desire to teach, instruct others, turn rebels back to God. Now, that's something not many of us are willing to do because it's not easy to do. But if I may say this, brothers and sisters, let it begin from our home. I know it's not easy. 
I know it's not easy to tell our children honor God and fear God. I know it's not easy. But if we have truly repented, if we have really received the forgiveness of God, if God's renewing work is welcome in our lives, it will be a natural thing for us, you know, that exhibit, you know, our, our renewed life exhibits attraction. Yeah? In that way, we teach our children, our grandchildren, about the ways of God. I know how easy, I know how difficult it is. Trust me, I know it is difficult. I always pray with my brother to, to guide their children. When night is day and day is night. Many of our children have become like that. Coming to church, no need lah, kuku. I pray at home. It's not easy. But when there is a true repentance, yeah, there is this desire to want to instruct others, testify to God's ways, instructing others so that others too can turn to God and do God's ways. Don't leave your children be. If you think that your children's mind and heart are already turned to God, then go on our knees and pray. Beg God to help. Fast and pray if we need to. And then look at our own lives. Is our lives one that exhibits one who has received the forgiveness of God? We need to do that. That is true repentance. Many parents have given up on that. We just want to be in our children's good books. We don't instruct our children anymore. We don't direct our children anymore. But we need to do that. We need to do that. Because that is a mark of a repentance in our lives. Fifthly and lastly, true repentance brings sacrifices that are pleasing to God. Verses 16 to 19. You do not delight in sacrifice or I will bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. David could have just bring many bulls, thousands of bulls from his a lot from his big collection and offer, but David knows that that is not what God wants. David need to reckon with his sin. David need to call his sin his sin. David need to confess and David needs to repent of his devious sins. David need to let God break him down and say, you have been found out. David need to repent for he knows that that only then that his offerings and sacrifices will be pleasing to God. Brothers and sisters, do not swap our religiosity with our repentance. Do not mistake our repentance. Do not mistake our reli religiosity for our repentance. So I come to church, God has to do this for me. No. I think God desires a true repentance within us. Then we know that out of that newness that God is doing in our lives, out of the forgiveness that I receive from God, I bring to God an offering, which is not just an offering, it's a sacrifice. Sacrifice uh, means it's something that costs us, not leftovers. Let us take to heart the repentance of our sin so that we may truly experience the joy of being forgiven, so that we may truly experience the joy of our salvation so that we may truly appreciate the greatness of God's mercies and love for us. For then, we can tell others what a great, merciful, and loving God whom we worship. Let us prepare our hearts, brothers and sisters, as we come